the plan today is just to look at design for disassembly, which is hopefully also useful for your projects and sort of anything you do for the rest of your life, basically. It is an aspect of Cradle to Cradle. William McDonough, American architect, um, Michael Braungart, my chemist from Germany, leading gurus in this kind of area, and you know, I'm hoping you've all read their book. Uh, but another guru that I'm introducing today as well, um, this image is from his book, it's Nathan Shedroff. I'll give you the full reference shortly. This is an image from his book, and I just want you to have this in the back of your mind when we're thinking about this subject. You can see these are material labels, you probably recognise them. This is a simple child's toy. Um, it doesn't even do anything particularly special, probably just talks. I don't know its full function. Not something that's going to change the world, but just look at how many <laughs> different materials have gone into that product. And they're all glued together, very difficult to separate. Just a very bad example to start with of what we're going to be talking about. So what is Design for Disassembly? It is a process for creating designs, not only designs that are easily taken apart, because every bit of time you spend having to take something to pieces is detracting from um, the, that, the people wanting or desiring to do that, and things that people will bother to take apart. There's be something valuable in there. It's all about um, the economics of this process as well. So a good example of these Timberland Earth Keepers, 70 to 90%, I don't know why that varies, but um, again, I'm just taking this from Shedrod's book, can be reused or recycled. So I've got valuable materials that people will want, plastic, fab plastic fabrics that people will use for other sources. This is a very product-focused technique. So we're going, okay, we've got product here. We're going to look at it, we're going to review it, and we're going to design it so that it can be taken apart. Bearing in mind all the discussions we've been having, what, just a quick question for you, why are those product focused sort of discussions about design sometimes a bit limited? Thinking about the way you approach your major projects as well and the way we ask you to approach them. We don't ask you to redesign a product, do we? What do we ask you to do? Solve the problem. Solve the problem, yeah. So this is the problem of how do you boil water sustainably? So just to give you example, the real solution to a sustainable kettle might be a tap. See what I mean? So it's just actually focusing on a product and redesigning is not always the way forward. Oliver Heath has a great blog. Oliver Heath is a local sustainable designer. You've probably heard him. He's also a TV celebrity. We actually made a TV show with him a few years ago. So claim to fame there. Where is it normally considered in the process? Well, I've seen a lot of analyses of the product design process and Seeing design for disassembly considered as this final point um, on the timeline. So if you're thinking about the materials, um, the way that energy is used or the kind of byproducts during the manufacture or the lifetime of the project we can. And we see design for disassembly right at the end there. Um, but actually these principles are useful for all phases of the product's life. So if we use these techniques, I'm going to take you through step by step shortly, um, it can actually help with repair and, and upcycling. So yeah, the reason it's become part of big business is the redirection. It's waste electrical and electronic equipment. And it came about in 2006 as a response to a lot of electrical products. They were either going into life or being incinerated and it was just an urgent directive to try and solve that problem. So it's a really nice symbol to illustrate this down at the Eden Project. It's an amazing exhibition space and they've actually got, they've got all sorts of different exhibitions. Some of them are kind of biospheres that have a whole tropical rainforest inside of them and discuss kind of relevant environmental issues to that as well. But this is a, a giant man who's called Wiener. What he represents is the amount of waste and electronic products that we all discard in a lifetime. So they reckon it's about three tonnes worth of electrical products. That's what it looks like, what you throw away in your lifetime. And if you go see your own, I've given you, it gives you that kind of breakdown. So 69% of that is, is large household appliances. I have no idea who researched that, they need a medal. So what the WE Directive asked them to do was a lot, a lot to do with obviously should try and use these sort of techniques to, to make this process easier, but also a lot of information provided 
So to inform people who are buying the equipment about what to do with it at the end of their life and appropriate labelling, you know, do not put it in a bin, take it down to your local recycling centre and so on. Messages for the people who do recycle, how to dismantle it, what hazardous substances might be in there, so what special processes might be necessary. And also um, feedback to the government on how much equipment they've sold, how much of it they've sort of collected, how much they've reprocessed. Not really an interesting fact, it's a quite dull fact really, but I used to work for Rank Sinks and they had these principles there when I worked there in the 1990s. And there's a reference there again, lots more information than I can go into any detail with today. All of their products are use these principles in their creation and design for disassembly. This is what um, a closed loop system looks like for a product that's mass manufactured. So just going through that sort of quickly, um, this is kind of the production area, designing it so it can be recycled, recycled. The sort of centralised production unit there. Product is made, packaged, delivered, used by the customer. Um, it's returned to the factory. This is this kind of systems design. The products are collected as part of the contracted deal with these products. It's in the interest of both parties to have this um, arrangement. People who lease their products, it means that they get updated and improved for the factory and the, the manufacturers. It means that they get to sort of keep their redirected for one thing, but also they get sort of a lot of materials reclaimed. So obviously sorting the parts. And this is where the kind of the loop divides. So somebody has to inspect all these things as well. But the idea is that none of it goes into Amazon. Um, some of it is returned back to primary materials where it has to be reformed, reprocessed, recycled. And what they can, they take through this kind of inner loop. So they will try and repair certain parts. So they're kind of like a magic bit here where they're looking at the circuit boards and updating them and you know making them more up to date. Before it can actually, all of those things can be fed back into this centralised production line. So yeah, again, um, people staying on the, uh, the same page, when you're working for a big company like Rank Suits, a lot of time is spent making through communication and systems and processes to make sure that everybody knows what's actually happening. This, this is just a few of the parts you'd probably find in, in a photocopier or an office product. Um, you know, this is the metal frame, ground down, had to be made into its constituent elements um, for reuse, plastic plastic things, re-pelleted, re-processed, remade into something else. From that to the kind of the hazardous parts where they have to replay things like cadmium and mercury. So you don't need to remember any of that, that's just so that you <coughs> are aware of how complex it is to manage this particular process. So what's the worst case scenario of a product that's been sort of badly designed for being disassembled? This is the obvious one. Two different materials completely bonded together. So you see a lot of these milk or juice cartons, difficult to separate this plastic cap area from what the rest of it is usually a waxed carton. So common manufacturers, we have developed systems for recycling Tetra packs, um, but this plastic cap and spell are a, a comp another complication. Nobody's going to take the time to separate them, it may not be that complex, but nobody's going to do that because it's a cheap product and there's very little return as well on that process. Another kind of example, modern clothing, a lot of, a lot of it will be a kind of a blend, it will be something like 80% rayon, 20% cotton or whatever. Um, technically speaking, um, cotton or natural fabrics could be composted, um, they probably wouldn't compost on your garden compost, but they're commercially technically compostable, whereas synthetic materials are recyclable. But put the two together and none of that can actually happen. So what are the practical steps that we can take to try and create products that will be disassembled? A, a good reference for this is Nathan Shedroff's book, um, Design is the Problem. Doctor, here's one I made earlier. This is a breakdown of what this looks like when you take it apart. So you can come and have a closer look at this in a minute. But you can see, a bit like the toy example, lots of different parts. It's not the worst culprit, actually. It at least uses common fasteners. Can you see that the screws are all the same as I hold it up? So at least you only need one screwdriver to take this thing apart. So, step one, fairly obvious, having fewer parts. 
um, if you can try and make things from pure material parts and fewer of them, that is the first basic sort of step. So Phillips uh, revolutionised one of the designs of their nebulizers just using this simple principle. They actually found that by applying this design dis disassembly techniques, they actually made a less expensive product. They actually, through having to be innovative through it, actually created something that was more efficient. They used this, they, they um, discovered this Venturi system. That, so it actually delivers the product more quickly and more safely. It's also easier to clean and easier to use. So number three is making the electronic components easy to remove. Now there's three different reasons for this. The first is that that is the most likely thing to need repairing of any product. It's the, you know, obviously, it's probably the thing that's going to break down first. So if you can remove that, that's going to be um, a really good thing. So if you are designing for repair, that's going to be um, fantastic. So it's probably the most contaminating part of the product. Um, if you've got plastics and things like that, or, or metal, you can't recycle metals and just kind of melt the electronics in there. That's not going to work. It's, it's also got high value. There's a lot of precious metals in there. So it's one of the things that people are more likely to want to try and remove and, and get hold of. So it does encourage recycling if you can get those electronics out of there. This is a great reference here again. Um, open IDO. Lots of kind of ideas for reclaiming um, PCBs and making them into something else. There's one there which is about creating solar panels from them. So an example is the Julep toaster. Mounting components, so these are the techniques, mounting components on a, a PCB that's got detachable leads, avoiding soldering because that takes time and effort to um, remove the solder. Um, it's also got mercury in it, usually it's toxic. Use, up, use plugs that push into place and also can be easily pulled out um, and add to a modular component. We're going to come to a modular design shortly. The other thing is providing information about these things. The thing about the Julep toaster, you can go online, you can work out how to replace your own parts. It's a very expensive toaster, it's about £150, but it has great longevity. It's also, you can take it back to the shop and it's part of the service chain again. It can be repaired by the, the people who sell it. So on a similar note, um, modular design is a great sort of design principle anyway. Um, it provides more sort of flexible solutions. This is the obvious example of sort of slightly sort of shoes where you can have modular bits so you can kind of make your, you can update your shoes and make them look more exciting or just have a different look every day. Um, it allows updates, um, so yeah, if it's something that has a technical certain lifespan, say, you know, something's improved about it, a refrigerator component, something like that. If it's a modular design, you can remove that part and replace it with something that's going to work better. Batteries are another good example. Um, it also makes it emotionally more durable. So there's an example of a modular furniture set here, which you can, you can make your own different designs out of the furniture. And there's some more references there to... So a more technical example of how we might use this, on the left here we've got a design that's been created that isn't modular, it's, you know, everything's randomly sort of put together, so you can see there are three parts to the main case of this, and they've sort of made that into one, they made that a modular thing, just sort of comes off in one, there's no fasteners, uh, four of these you know, things that hold it together, or embodied into one piece again, made into one module. But significantly the, um, the electronic parts as well, all combined together, made into one module. TWI company who um, have lots of examples of um, design with assembly and modular designs. That image back to rank Xerox again. Fifth principle, um, keep things that commonly need replacing together. So it works alongside the modular design as well. Keep them obvious keep them together. So this is an example of where the sensors here are kind of part of this general piece of construction. They're embedded into the plastic, particular kind of manufacturing um, style. Here they've all been attached to a metal plate, so when the sensors are starting to wear out, you just replace that whole metal plate. Considering the fasteners carefully is principle six, basically. Ideally you would have no fasteners, you'd have one great big bit of plastic, well, 
is minimally designed plastic, be put into recycling or reuse. But that's in an ideal world. If you've got to have plasters, make sure they're accessible. Make sure you can get to them to undo them. Try to use standardised fasteners so that you don't need a whole array of different tools to remove them. So that's why I was pointing out the fact that they're actually all the same size screw for that kettle. At least they've thought about that. You only need one screwdriver to take to that to, to undo it all. If you can, use fastenings that will snap or clip together, but importantly, importantly they will snap apart again as well. So just look at a bit of an exception to that. If you are going to create something that's a complex shape that maybe needs two or more parts that snap together, just try and make sure they're the same material. So you've all come across this um, type of injection model where things click and join together. If you're going to do that, try and um, use the same material. So here's a nice example on that reference there. Just a simple uh, tooth flossing product. It just kind of flips apart, so it's, it's um, snap clipped together, but it will snap clip apart, just with a bit of fiddling around. The whole thing is open up and everything falls to pieces. Polypropylene, which obviously can be recycled, it's just quite a neat way to do it. And it's all one piece as well. Herman Miller are um, a very um, renowned company who design their products so that their fasteners are all um, very consistent, easily removed, easily accessible. They, they are very good sort of case study to look into more if you, if you want to know more about how to design things uh, so that the fasteners come away so you can see them easily. So number seven is avoiding adhesives are a, a really key reason why things are not um, disassembled. It's actually quite difficult to, to remove them. It requires quite a lot of processing quite often. It's also ruin the properties of whatever you're doing, particularly um, silicone is used a lot. Caulking with silicone is used to sort of make things stick together. That makes them non-recyclable. Um, and they're kind of like nasty, toxic chemicals anyway. So if you have to use adhesive, you use ones that have a low solvent emission, ones that are not going to sort of seep out and, and cause toxins in the environment. So an example again from Ryan Seawalk. So the old style was it was caulked, it was all kind of spindle here, this metal spindle was caulked into this plastic wheel. This is the kind of standard wheel that goes on the bottom of a photocopier, completely integrated and glued on to this metal stem. Just the simple use of an E-ring meant that that could be flipped off and the whole uh, wheel could just be replaced. So if you imagine that's fastened on the bottom of the product, how inconvenient it was that the whole thing was glued together and as you know the whole broken wheel thing. Principle number eight is try and keep surfaces as clean as possible. So not using paint surfacing, not using coatings or plating or those things. Again, it's just destroying those properties of the, the materials for, for recycling. So Toshiba developed this kind of ridge pattern um, to surface polycarbonate. Uh, to give it a nice finish, it just meant that they can't, they don't have to use those coatings that a lot of companies commonly use. Labelling things, not going to go on, this is pretty obvious, don't have to go on about this too much. Point nine, obviously don't put plastic labels on metal things, metal labels on plastic things. PVC is a bad material to put in labels, that is a contaminant. Things can be stamped usually instead of labelled. This is Ben Thompson's project. He did a fantastic system for helping to design products that can quickly and easily come apart. Um, and this is how you fasten the different elements of a product together. But it was also about how to sort the material. So he had a colour-coded system for different types of, so I don't know, like metals, that would be plastics, for example. Um, and he worked with companies that do dissemble and recycle products to to work out what the best solution was. The other thing is, can you add value to the conveying part of the materials? Are they actually worth getting in the first place? I've just got an example of a, a diamond head there. If you if you were going to sort of recycle that engineering tool, you might it might be worth doing because there's a di little diamond in there. So what you're trying to do is design your products with some kind of metaphorical diamond in there that people might want to get to um, in order to make sure it is actually taken apart. Look at the materials you're thinking about using. Do people commonly recycle them? 
what are the things that people use locally? Are they likely to be recycled? This is another factor in it. So green algae are a really interesting company. They do all sorts of um, um, reprocessing for people. I'm going to go through. These are some of the obvious things that people have to do when they're assessing um, an existing product for whether it should be disassembled. So number of elements or modules. Look at the type of bonding and fastening method. So insert moulding is a particularly uh, notorious way of designing product so that it can't be recycled. It involves taking metal parts, whatever they are, and actually um, putting them into the injection moulding and then kind of adhesion we've already talked about. So yeah, just have a look at all these different ranges of bonding, bonding and fastening methods and evaluate them carefully and think about what's best for your product. Have a look at all those kind of different operations that are needed for disassembly as well. Does it need to be fractured apart? Do things need to be drilled? Do those kind of adhesives need to be processed so that it can be unglued? How much heating does it need? How much lubricating? You go, yeah, I'm going to be really good and take this product apart. Yes, but how much energy is it actually going to take to do that? Are any of these things going to be worse than what you're actually trying to achieve in the first place? Um, and yeah, what are those special tools <coughs> required for disassembly? Um, does it need special tooling that people are not going to have, which means that it's not actually, people are not going to bother with it, no matter how well you've actually designed it and otherwise. Is it a simple tool or is it something that's just going to pop by hand, like the shoe 